my God. Well, I want to read something, actually, kind of a message from Matt for us today. It's, a, it's something he wrote and posted on Facebook the other day. And it's so appropriate and so freaking awesome. I want to share it with you guys. So this is from Matt. Title is, There is No Flaw in You. How many times have you encountered struggle within yourself or in someone else in your life and it feels insurmountable? It's as if they're broken. It's as if you are flawed by design. How many times have you encountered selfishness in this world? Isn't it exhausting, tiring? It's disgusting, right? And yet most of the world has come to accept it. Or we may judge everyone for it. And many times we certainly do, but, but we still think that's all there is. <laughs> We have so many different ways of saying it, like it's just human nature, or we're all sinful, or we're all broken. No one's perfect. How many times have you heard that? Well, and we all have flaws. Both the world and the church have normalized brokenness. We have normalized selfishness. And for the most part, we've given up as a people on the idea of actually being free from ego. Wow. You know, ego. I'm talking about that part of us that is identified with selfishness and self-preservation rather than loving the person we want to be. I mean, even the preachers don't live it, right? Long, long story short, I'm convinced that there is more. I've tasted and seen we can actually love one another. People can live free from ego and selfishness. And over the past 15 years in our local community and elsewhere, at home and other places, we've been made aware of what Christ has done. I've met folks and experienced it for myself. It's, it is very possible to live in a new childlike identity in Jesus. Not by our efforts, which only produce more pride in our own ego abilities and that holier than thou vibe that's so disgusting but not by a long process that never ends except maybe after we die no what would that help in this life anyway if we have to wait to die to get it why would god leave us bound up for any amount of time no it's nothing like that our freedom comes from a simple awareness that Jesus has already cleansed us and healed us. He alone, by his one saving act, has restored us to ourselves. Jesus enacted a new creation, both renewed to our original state and given us an ecstatically better-than-ever-before state. He has rescued us from our selfish sickness, completely whole. This doesn't mean we don't make mistakes from time to time. It does mean that we have re-identified with who we really are in him, and it produces fruit like kindness, love, childlikeness in our own nature. Knowing this and experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit inside means actual life transformation whom the son sets free is free indeed can you imagine if the whole world was walking free from selfishness and ego oh god it's the greatest part of what jesus has done that and giving us perfect union and relationship with god and one another and these two are absolutely connected to begin to live in this, we simply must see what God knows to be true about us in union with him. The revelation of the scriptures must begin to hold more weight than our personal beliefs or our experiences and the unpopular voices of our day or the popular voices of our day. Jesus defines us and nothing else. For real, in our thought life, at our core, his reality must be our vision. For by, for by a single offering, he has made the sanctified perfect for all time. 
Hebrews 10, 14. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning for God, for God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he's been born of God. That's 1 John 3, 9. And you are in him. Wow. Wow made full and having come to fullness of life in Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. And he is the head of all rule and authority of every angelic principality and power. Colossians 2.10. For it is because of one man's trespass that death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in this life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. <laughs> For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, but by the one man's obedience, the many are made righteous. Romans 5. Scriptures like these reveal the truth of what Jesus has done for us. This is what changed my life forever. As those truths became lodged in my mind, I no longer saw myself as flawed or selfish or broken or struggling, and I no longer saw anyone, anyone else that way either. I cannot describe how life-changing this revelation is. It inspires confidence and trust, not in myself, but in the Spirit of Christ in union with me to continuously inspire me to make the best choices. For it is only by Christ within that I can live ego-free. Yes, it's not something that requires my ongoing assistance to maintain. I've been there too. And it's only exhausting when we try to depend on myself. And I become proud when I succeed because then I am condemned when I fail. And it's just a lot of work trying to be what I already am. Freedom from selfishness comes when the focus on I is completely gone. The Apostle Paul, the great preacher of grace, said it this way, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Yet not I, it says. That's the powerful phrase. The I there in the Greek is the word ego. The I was crucified with Christ. That's why Jesus died. He didn't die his own death. He died our death. He took our false self to the grave once and for all. And when Jesus died, he took the ego of all humanity with him. This is the joy of my life now. I feel his virtue living within my core. My old selfish self is completely gone. It feels so good to only feel love coming from inside me. And it's a real tangible experience every day now. And it works. I'm no longer waiting for some future day when I can live free and full of love for all. This is the glorious truth of my life, and I continue to share it with others. I'd love to discuss this together with anyone, if you want to walk in this experience too. However, it's a big, complicated, it isn't a big, complicated journey. Jesus did it once and for all. You are not broken. You are not stuck. Your ego has already died in Jesus. There is no flaw in you. Whew. Wow. Wow. Let's let, Drunk. That, let's let that sink in. I mean, that's why we that's why we preach, that's why we teach, that's why we get together. Remind me again who I am. Tell me what's already happened. Yeah. It's good news. Past tense. 
my God. You know, when God opened my eyes, I started to see everyone as he saw them. And I'd walk in a room and I could only say, my gods, because God has little gods. It's, we're his baby gods, you know. It's like, no, really, that's crazy. That thought, that thought or that verse in Psalm 82 used to be so offensive to me. It says, you're gods. Why? Because we're all sons and daughters of the Most High. Whew. And in 1 John 1, it says, we quote it a lot, you know, in him is no darkness at all. But John's not writing it there because he's trying to tell us about who God is. He's writing that there because he's making the point that we are in him and in him is no darkness at all. <laughs> there is no darkness. There's no flaw in you. That's a quote from the song of Solomon. You're lovely. You're beautiful. So, you know, these truths, these become foundational. For me, they become like the gemstones in my new house and the foundation of my new house that he's building up for me to walk in. So, wow. That's why we're here. <laughs> Woo! And that's why I need every one of you, because sometimes... I forget that I need somebody to remind me For sure. and I need to know I, I need your body parts because if we're part of a body, I'm a partaker of the divine nature. I'm not the whole enchilada. <laughs> I need the other parts and every one of us brings that such a unique and special part to this body. And so when I meet someone new, it's like, oh, it's just family I haven't met yet. You know, I've missed you. I could literally feel the addition into myself becoming aware of this one, you know, that I didn't have or didn't, wasn't aware of before. And so <clears throat> that's why, like Ryan was saying, when you see, and, you know, these new friends and family, you can't help but fall in love with them because they're already family, you know. <laughs> And they're already so important to add to our body, you know? Yeah. So, wow. Wow. <laughs> so I'm thankful that we have, you know, we need, I, I love Ephesians 4 because it talks about how we need the fivefold ministry. We need those to edify the body. But that's why the apostles, prophets, preachers, teachers, they're all there to edify the body and to bring it up into what? Because he goes on to say what Paul's saying is the prophetic promise there as he wrote in Ephesians 4, until the whole body becomes aware of each part that they play. And then when we connect together, then we become this fullness of the full stature of Christ. And so that's why we lean on the teachers to give us an introduction to the message. And then we connect together and become more than we ever imagined. I'm way bigger than I could have ever imagined. So that's who you are. That's who, who, that's who we are. That's who we are. Wow. <laughs> Take a drink of that. Can I get an amen? Amen. Mm. So that's why I asked earlier. It's like, I mean, we all have testimonies. Everybody has a story to tell because we're here because something's happened. Or at least we're looking for that thing that's going to bring about this transformation of our whole lives. It's a completely different lifestyle that we're living. And it's so radically different. I mean, it's intentionally this stark contrast to what the world has to offer that we do need each other to help keep us going because we're facing a world out there and everyone sees it where it's divided, you know, but my God, especially these last few weeks, I've felt this wooing back to unity. Remembering again that we don't need the divisiveness. We don't want the separateness. 
that doesn't work. It doesn't help me. And even if I have beliefs that you don't have, thoughts or ideologies, politics, <laughs> that you don't have, none of that can separate us from the love of God, from the love of each other. We can walk in union when we're doing it from a place of just utter dependent love, you know, and the love and recognizing our need for one another and our love for one another, the love that comes because he loved us first. <laughs> so it's both at once very humbling and yet very empowering to become aware of the nature that we have. Yeah. <laughs> There's one nature, his divine nature that we are. So, whew, wow. <laughs> so we're going to start talking about John 17. I don't know how far we're going to get into it today. Hopefully you guys know this scripture or this passage or this chapter, excuse me. But if you know John's writing in the gospel of John from chapters like from 13 to 17, it's, it's a long diatribe that Jesus is giving to his disciples. It starts in about halfway through chapter 13 after it's at, at, at the, um, uh, the Last Supper, after Judas leaves, and then he's talking directly to those that are his disciples there, and he's consoling them, he's prophesying, he's trying to tell them what's going to come, what's coming, is in the very near future, and he's trying to tell them, you know, I'm going to go away, guys, and I'm going to die, and you're going to be sad, and then I'm going to come back. And part of my heart in wanting to do this teaching is to kind of debunk a little bit of the theology we've been taught, maybe. Um, because many of us, growing up in church, I was taught like that scripture that says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house are many mansions. And that was one of the verses that I used to just excuse myself <clears throat> To believe that I had to wait till I died, you know, before I got to go to heaven and live in one of those mansions. And, uh, and that's not at all what Jesus is saying there. What he's saying is I'm going away for a few days to prepare a place for you. And so in, this, in these few chapters here, you see him prophesying about what's going to happen. It's going to be his crucifixion his death, and then his burial. And then when he's raised and he exits the tomb, he even tells Mary Magdalene, who meets him there, he's like, don't hug me yet because I haven't gone to the Father. I'm going to the Father, but I'll be back. And then he comes back, resurrected, in a form that's not even recognizable to his disciples. And yet he makes it known who he is. They, they do recognize him. And he spends 40 days with them. And then he counsels them to go and wait for the next promise, right? So one of the things I, I posted about you know, this conversation today is that, well, what if, what, if, what if Jesus already came back, you know? It's a little provocative. It's kind of a bait and switch because Jesus is still going to come back again. But let's consider the fact First of all, I was going to quote, let me quote this for you, another statement by our beloved Matt. He's like, if you're more excited about Jesus coming from the sky than you are about Jesus living in your belly right now, <laughs> then maybe you haven't understood the gospel yet. <laughs> I, I love that, by the way. I really love that. That was so dead on. <laughs> Come on. And that's what we're that's what we're preaching because it seems so radical because it, because the church has become normalized in the distance and delay, you know, yeah. so much of the mainstream church, you know. But things are changing. If seeing it, we're seeing this, you know, this deep grassroots movement 
of this change that God is bringing a restoration to his body. And it's still the remnant of the element of this pure gospel that remains from the beginning. And then we're just getting a taste of it. But it's still that promise that Paul was saying, even in his writings, you know, you're starting to see it all over the world. People are getting it and people are being transformed. And we want to walk in a power that transforms nations in a single day. And the kings will come to your glory. I mean, my God, if you haven't seen that, I don't know how many kings we got in this Zoom chat right now. But my God, there's some potent people here. Whoo! And some have platforms that get to speak to millions of people. That's beautiful, man. Oh, my God. And we get to minister with them. And then there's others that will go into the prisons. And some of us that live what seems to be a really quiet life. And yet our lives are exuding a light that the world needs and wants and is hungering and thirsting for. And so here we are, you know, gathering up and being empowered to preach a message that the whole world wants because it's good news. It's really, really good. That's just one way you can tell if you're preaching the gospel is it coming across that uh, even the world will receive it because you're telling them something first that already resonates deep in their core and they're already hearing from God. You're just affirming that but then it's going to offer them a transformation so profound and walk us into a lifestyle that's so radically different that you, once you taste and see, you'll never want to go back, right? <laughs> I mean, I can't go back. Can you go back? I mean, I've seen too much, man. I've tasted and seen too much. So Jesus is telling his disciples there in that beautiful, long, just uh, intimate conversation he's having with his peeps there at the Last Supper, knowing he's about to face, you know, his what he's been called and sent to do and be. And he's trying to tell them, you know, guys, I'm going to die and it's going to be painful. That's why he uses the analogy in this conversation about the woman who has to, in labor, you know, she's given birth to the child. It's for a short time. It's really painful. But then, you know, when the baby's born, it's, oh, my God. And I don't know if you, if you guys that have kids, my God, when you've seen your child born. When you lay eyes on that child for the first time, it's like, oh, my God, something overwhelms you and overtakes you in that moment. <laughs> and that's the analogy he's trying to give as he, as he knows they're going to see him again. He's telling them, I'm coming back. I'm not going to be gone long. And in the meantime here, as I'm after my death, I'm going into hell. And I'm going to plunder hell. And then I'm going to go to my father. And I'm leading all of captivity captive, as it says in Ephesians. And I'm bringing them up here. And in my father's house are many dwelling places. And then the conclusion is that I brought this presence back, the Holy Spirit. I will not leave you as orphans. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. You're never going to be alone. You're never going to be without me. But I'm going to the Father now, and I'm making a way for you. I'm literally the intermediary between your thinking you have a lowly human form to complete union with the source, the God of the universe. So I want to introduce you to your Father, and we're going to send back to you the Spirit of the father, the promise of the father, so that we will come and make our abode with you. So that's why he preached, you know, the, the gospel is heaven is at hand. Prayed in the Lord's prayer that we pray that as it is in earth, you know, in heaven, 
So <clears throat> he brought heaven into earth. He brought in the fullness of time all of heaven and earth into one. So this is like what we were reading the last few weeks, what we've been talking about the last few weeks is coming into the culmination of what this is. And so this is the Lord's Prayer. And when he starts it, in my opinion, this is the real Lord's Prayer, John 17. Whew, you ready for this? We'll do a little, do a little reading. I'm not sure how far we're going to get today. Hopefully you guys are still with me. Who's tracking with me? I'm not boring you, am I? Whew. Ding, ding. You feeling meow. it? Meow. Yeah, meow. <laughs> I love your meows, Rainy. Wow. Wow. Yes. Hey, David. Wow. Bryce. Oh, my God. It's Bryce, I'm hoping, is coming. Him and his family's moving here, too, from Vegas. <clears throat> wow. All right, I'm going to read some of this, and I'm going to get whacked doing it because <laughs> the revelation of it is so, whoo, wow, wow. Mm. Yeah. So here we are. Mm. Mm. John 17, I'm going to read it from the, um, the New King James New King Jimmy. <laughs> if you look at that, and I love how King James breaks it down. Jesus is, is praying here from in John 17, and he's praying in three different parts. The first part of that chapter, it's Jesus' own prayer for himself. And the second part is his prayer for his disciples. I'm not praying for the world, he says there. The third part, and where he, he's where he's praying for the unbelievers and the ones in the future that will come to this message. And he's praying there for the whole world. Right. So let's start. Uh, hmm. Hmm. John 17. Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Wow. <laughs> Look at that again. You've given, he says, Father, you've given me authority over all flesh so that I could give eternal life to as many as you've given me. How many did he give him? All flesh, <laughs> right? I mean, some of us like to twist that and it's like we're going to exclude others because they're not included, but it doesn't say that there. And he says in, chat, in verse three, <clears throat> and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He's talking about himself in the third person there. I've glorified you on the earth, and I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself. One translation says glorify thou me with thine own self <laughs> this is what's happening here jesus is returning to the space i'll read that next but he's praying that he's glorified with the very person of the father that with glorify me with thine own self dude it's personal Right. Uh, so now, O oh Father, glorify me with yourself and with the glory which I had with you from before the world was. <laughs> He's going to return to a state from which he was and is and is to come. He always was. 
there's something there. I don't know if we get, can't get into that. There's a lot I don't know about that too. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking about that line for a long time. But that was his prayer for himself. Glorify thou me and let my glory be your glory, be my glory, and that the you know that you be glorified in all that I am and all that I've done. It is finished. The time has come. So the next part, Jesus is praying for his disciples. He says to his disciples about the Father, he says in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all the things which you've given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. So I pray for them. I don't just pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. So what he's doing here is he's beginning to make this connection. He's, he's pointing out that here he is in the midst of them as one of them. And he's bringing them up to this place of this revelation and return to their own father. Pray our father. <laughs> it's big. Because I, I realize that a lot of, a lot of, the purpose of Jesus Christ is a revelation that was never known before by the Jews. His own people never understood the magnitude of God as being their father. So he's bringing us an introduction to the father. Jesus Christ came to introduce us or reintroduce us to our father. And he's also come as a manifestation and a revelation of us to introduce us to ourselves. So Jesus Christ is that vicarious man that in him represents all of the Father and all of us. So this is who we are. That's why Jesus Christ and him crucified, the magnitude of just knowing that, if we choose to know nothing but that, when you start to explore what it means, what is this Jesus Christ? It's big. <laughs> it's big. <clears throat> so I, he's praying for his disciples. <clears throat> all, all mine are yours and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So now I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your name which is your nature and character, the very nature of the Father. Keep them, O oh Father, in your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. I have given them your word, and the world has Amen. hated them, because they're not of the world. Wow. Wow. But, <clears throat> wow, where am I? Okay. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. We're not of this world, guys. And it's talking about the systems of the world. It's not talking about, like, people. It's talking about the darkness. It's talking about the fallen nature, the, you know, the lower consciousness, <laughs> the self consciousness <clears throat> so <clears throat> so i do not pray that you should take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one they are not of the world just as i am not of the world sanctify them by your truth your word is truth and as you sent me into the world i also have sent them into the world 
and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Our sanctification comes from Jesus sanctifying himself in the truth that he put in us, <laughs> Christ in you, mystery revealed. Whew. So this, the next phase is Jesus prays for all believers to come and the world. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, and that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them. Wow, dude, that's why. The very glory, that word glory is just the literal manifestation, the physical manifestation of God, the presence of God in us. So, wow, we've been given, <clears throat> wow, where am I? Well, so in the glory which you gave me, I've given them that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, and that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and so the world may know that you have loved them just as you have loved me. It's what the world knows. They will know us by the love, guys. Wow. Wow. So, wow, his final prayer is, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and I will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. <laughs> so that's, well, that's the part I wanted to stress today. That the ending there is this part where he says, oh, he prays that where I am, that you may be also. So the father answered that prayer. That's why before he went away, he said, I'm going to prepare a place. And then when he sent the Holy Spirit, it was proof that he's come to dwell. He's made this very body his dwelling place. You were intricately, fearfully, and wonderfully made for the sole purpose to occupy God. You are his address, we're his dwelling place. And so he's come and made his abode in us, with us. And so the magnitude of that, if you go on and read, especially in the book of Acts, you know, what happens next, these next few steps, I would encourage us all to read, especially study that passage from John 13 through 17 you know make it clear what Jesus is saying you know let it soak in to you in that day you will know that I am in you and you are in me and we are in the father so <clears throat> for me a lot of this started with me getting an introduction to a father I never knew he invited me in, said, what's behind the veil? You know, he wooed me in. And at the time, I thought, I'm so unworthy. I literally could see myself crawling on my belly like the worm that I thought I was, trying to approach the throne. Hebrews 4 says, come boldly to the throne. But I crawled up to his feet like a worm and begged and cried. And then he just kept pulling me up here, lifting me up. And I put my face in his lap and wept some more. And then he finally pulled me up and set him down in his lap. And he just enveloped me, embraced me. And for months, 
for the rest of these last nine years, he's been convincing me of how much he loves me. The whispers of his father's heart toward me. I love you. I love you. I don't care what you think. <laughs> he told me once, Lynn, I don't care what you think about yourself. But what I want to know is, do you want to know what I think about you? So it's more important to discover what he thinks about us. And that was the beginning of letting go of my trust and faith in what I thought I knew and my trust and faith in my experiences or what I concluded from my experiences and started to come into a revelation of, oh my God, who am I? What are we? Where are we? So, whoo, can I get an amen? Amen! Oh my God. Woo! Oh my God. Yeah. Oh man. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. Uh, sweet. Jeez. You feel it? <laughs> Testify, somebody. Come on, Cletus. No. <laughs> oh, that you're Amen. Drunk, Lynn. Huh? Perfectly, perfectly, perfectly drunk. And holy, <laughs> and holy, You're a holy, 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 perfect You're man. You're holy. And we <laughs> multiplied. We multiplied. Isn't that amazing? <sighs> Come on. Um, I just wanted to share this uh, story short. Whoa, Jesus. Oh, my God. That message is so amazing, amazing, amazing. Ha. It has to do with our union. Mm. Just in case we want to linger on the union. Mm -hmm. Whoa, which I highly recommend. Yes. Woo. Uh, highly. Highly. Most highly. Hi. Baby, is that you? It is my lovey. I said hi Baby. earlier. If you didn't hear me, oh. I'm like, mm. yes. Hallelujah for good pipes uh. over there. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so, so one time, there was this one time. Uh. A bank, was it a band camp? <laughs> <laughs> there was this one time I was doing worship for uh, uh, John Scotland. Okay, whoa, wow. we love John Scotland. And so I, I always tell the musicians that I'm, I'm facilitating worship with. If I under, if I end up under my keyboard, just keep going. Don't worry about it because I'm just <laughs> intoxicated with my lover because he's so magnificent and so right. this time whoa i don't know if i was under the keyboard or playing the keyboard this i do not know it's like paul i don't know if i was in the body or out of the body i do right. not know but this is right. what happened whoa this is what happened so i was at the party bar in haverhill massachusetts some of you have been there oh my god whoa and mm. all of a sudden Everyone in the room, I'm sitting at the keyboard, I think. Anyway, I was doing worship. Oh, my God, it's happening again. Woo! And everybody in the room liquefied. And I saw and I experienced the liquefaction of everyone in the room and all the colors that represented the individual people. Whoa! And each person had many, many colors. We all liquefied into one but we didn't mm. lose our individual colors wow. or patterns but we liquefied into mm. one body all through the atmosphere wow. and it just if it it was amazing <laughs> and then then john preached <laughs> that message out of john what is it 17 the one that yeah. we won what you were just talking about yeah. anyway it was totally amazing mm. i never forgot it and mm. shaka i love mm. you guys we love you guys Wow. Okay. My God, I'll affirm that too, Mimi. I've had that happen to me twice where I've seen the whole earth covered with his glory. And it is like this incredible light. It's there. There's like uh, translucent colors of light. Like it's, it's, it's beyond words. We're literally like made from light. Everything that exists is from light. It's crazy. That is a vision mm. with your natural eyes that is mind-blowing. Mm. 
right? Come there on. Was no separation. We were like totally liquefied in his love. Mm. And it was so spectacular. There's no, yeah. no words. I saw it. I heard it. I felt it. I experienced it. And I, it's never gone away. I still. It's so true. Beautiful. So it's the truth of who we are. Really. <laughs> <laughs> well, people minds can't grasp it, right? Come on. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on. Whoo! Next. Come on, somebody. Give us what you got. Wow. Oh. Tell me everything. <laughs> I think I... Uh, um, this... Honor, I... Uh, I actually had a dream last mm -hmm. night. Uh, I th I think it has to do with this, but um, and I I wanted to I actually wanted to share it with everybody on here because it, it deals with people that are very very close to us, and it's the um I had a, I had a dream about the uh, about the Crowders last night, um, and. Uh, I, in in my dream, actually, I was hanging out with uh, um, with my old uh, with my old pastors, uh, like my my spiritual family, David and Mamie Bronson, and uh, um, somehow <laughs> um, somehow Jonas and Zeke and Nova, like they all <laughs> they all were coming over to play and 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 hang out and. This was this was this was having knowledge of of the funeral of Zeke's funeral, and I was like, "Hang on, wait a second! Whoa, 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 whoa. what's going on here?" Like, and I I don't know I don't know it still wasn't clear to me why exactly I was seeing Zeke, um, hanging out with everybody, but um, I was I was I remember in my dream I was talking to I was talking to David and I was like can you please explain to me what I'm seeing right now like can you please exp explain to me why it is that this because this makes no sense to me whatsoever and um, that the part of, of Zeke still being alive in human form uh, even after after the funeral procession had made made no sense and that still wasn't made clear but um, David pointed uh, me to one of the pictures that uh, our friend, our mutual friend Danny Orser took of uh, of of the funeral procession. Um, and in one of the pictures, you can actually see John uh, sitting sitting with Lily uh, in in one of the rows. And David said, "Look closer." And I looked closer at the at the picture again, and I could see Zeke sitting with John and Lily. And in uh, in the photos um, that was posted up about Zeke, like you could see uh, Zeke's name made of all these, uh, you know, all these different um, like words that m make up who Zeke was. Yeah. And I looked at I looked at David and I was like, wait a second. So Zeke was there the entire time, sitting next to his family, watching how much people loved him and people cared about him and like i don't know that just that blew me away it made me cry and i'm like this is this is insane yeah wow but it was real i mean it's the reality that's so mind-blowing oh my god dude Thanks yeah i'm sure that ryan wow wow yeah, I've lost some loved ones, too, and it's been so amazing to me. You'll see, even in dreams, God will come to the family members or people who love them and give them a vision of really the truth of what is. And that, that person that's gone over the other side will come back and speak to them or be present, you know, and they'll know that they're still alive, yeah. that they're still there, that they're still very much real. It's just a different form but it was i mean for me it was it was just incredibly powerful because it's like you know um whatever whatever doubt like it, to me it was confirmation of like whatever uh 
doubt in our in Zeke's mind, and in in this comes to this. This is also about us. It's like whatever doubt it is in our mind, exactly how much we're loved. If we can only see exactly how much, like if we were to be on the fly in the uh, on the wall when people, yeah. you know, talk about us, it, like especially people that are very dear, near and dear to us who love us very much, and to hear the words that they say about us, like. I think that for me personally, who, who struggles with a lot of self-condemnation and shame a lot, like I wouldn't like, there would be no doubt in my mind exactly how much I am loved and how, like what it is, who it is the truth about me, you know? And I think God really wanted to show me that not only because of, you know, currently what was going on, but also just a deeper revelation of, of myself as well. So it's like, it was, maybe it was him saying like, so the next time you, you get a doubt in your mind, like exactly you know who you are and how i feel about you 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 know you remember this wow that's why um ryan this is mimi in massachusetts and you are so spectacular i want to say that to you right now we don't we haven't met but i just want to encourage everybody this is why anytime somebody is on your mind your heart you get a thought of them um send them a text even, I mean, yeah. tell them how beloved they are because yeah. you really don't know what people are going through. Um, and a lot of the, you know, happiest, brightest people, they're not faking it, but internally or behind the scenes, they may be dealing, dealing with really heavy things. And maybe yeah. we all need to hear how wonderful we are and how beloved we are. We all need to hear it. And I just encourage you because when I, I used to be super, super shy. Anybody of you that know me, you're be like, what? There's no way. But I used right. to be, I know, look at Lynn. <laughs> like, I was, I was painfully shy. I would go to, yeah. I'm a musician. I used to be in theater and I would go to auditions and I'd sit in the back of the auditorium and cry because I was too afraid to audition and um, whatever. So that's not the case anymore. But when I lived in Boston and I was, this is like 30 some years ago. I was still kind of shy and I didn't know anybody. Holy Spirit said to me, be the kind of friend that you want to have. Mm -hmm. And so what she was saying to me was, be brave enough to take the initiative and don't be afraid of being foolish or looking stupid or being rejected or any of that. And yeah. if you have a moment to tell somebody how wonderful they are yeah. that in any capacity, even a little thing like, I love your hat. Or, oh my gosh, how'd you get your eyebrows that way? You're just, you look like whatever, a movie star, or you shine, anything at all. Do it. I'm telling you, don't. Yes. I've dealt with people who tried to commit suicide and have been suicidal. And so many times they just don't know how loved they are or that anybody's thinking of them. Wow. Um, how many times do I get messages from people who say, does anybody even know that I exist? You know, does yeah. anybody care? If I left the planet, would anybody care? Would anybody notice? The answer is yes, but we need to hear it. We need to say that. So you are, you're ambassadors. Sorry, Lynn, but I, you guys oh, are ambassadors of Jesus. You're ambassadors of the bliss, ambassadors of the glory. You carry this treasure in, in your very being, in the fiber of your mm. cells, of your body, of your thoughts, your heart, your emotions. Mm. You can, you can, you can save somebody's life. Mm. by smiling at them by extending a stranger and it doesn't mm -hmm. matter who it is don't worry about looking weird you have to yeah. let go of being afraid of just think about jesus and the love that shed abroad in your heart it's overflowing overflowing yes. overflowing and release it you will transform the world when you do this so good. and you'll transform somebody's life you absolutely will. You'll save somebody's life. I'm telling mm. you, I'm prophesying this. Mm. You will save somebody's life right. if you will get out of being afraid mm. and be like Holy Spirit told me. She said, be that friend that you want to have. Mm. And that meant don't wait for the other person to make the first move. And mm. she was right. She was right. I have a lot of good friends now and uh, I'm not shy like <laughs> I was. <laughs> All right, I love you guys. We love you. Thank you, Mimi. Wow. Welcome, Lynn. I love you very much. So powerful, honey. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about.
Come on. And never underestimate the power of hello. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, that sounds so simple and maybe trite, but you know, right. you know, you never know who might need that simple acknowledgement of just even if they don't respond back or don't act like they gave a rip or don't act like they even noticed you. It's like, it's not, it's just, even to just look at them and just say, hi, and walk away. You never know whether they needed that acknowledgement. <laughs> right. So. <laughs> and your hellos are so good, Rainy. I love it. <laughs> it's such an important um, point. That you're bringing up, Mimi, because it is in times like this. I don't know. Hopefully, many of you, most of you know John Crowder and his family, Lily, his wife. and But they're part of our family. You know, we've all mourned with them this week. It, it has brought up, you know, these deeper questions, maybe the deepest question. You know, why do people suffer? Why do we have pain? Why do we lose loved ones? Why, you know why do we deal with this stuff? But the point is that, that Mimi was making and Rainey and others is like, we need to stop and take notice and just remember, you know, to give that love, <laughs> to speak that word and that we can, we can have these conversations on purpose. You know, let's don't be afraid to talk about the hard things because it is in that place where I find, at least I find comfort in knowing that others have felt these things too and have gone through these things. I mean, how many of us have lost close loved ones, especially in maybe the most tragic ways? And yet, you know, we have, we have something to bring to one another, which is hope, <clears throat> love, you know, and, and faith. Let's keep the faith. But we're, I mean, we're having some of these conversations in our own community now because of this, because the tough questions, you know, I was just, I was just in a conversation with my brother today, this morning, and he's in, he's in Singapore on lockdown. He's been on lockdown for a year. And um, he's like, how do you guys even, why do you guys still get together? Because, you know, people are dying. Why would you be super spreaders and and I'm like, dude, there's something here that allows us to confront death face to face, knowing that death has lost its sting. You know, you can't touch this, dude. And that's, I think that's the ultimate um, place that we're, we all come to is the, like Jesus said, you got to lay down your life to find it. And we come to the death of ourselves. It's the death of that ego. Like you, Mimi, I used to be, dude, I, my biggest fear was stage fright. I, I would hyperventilate before I could speak like this in a company of people. But only now, because of who I know I am and the power of the Holy Spirit in me, am I able to speak, you know. And now out of a place of rest and confidence, because I've soaked in it for years knowing this stuff. You know, it's not me. And I'm not worried about what I look like anymore. <laughs> I'm intentionally crazy for the world's sake. You know, Paul says we're fools for Christ, right? And so it's not because I'm glorying in my foolishness. It's because what this is is so different. And to stand in the face of someone who's living in fear of death, and tell them, dude, I'm not afraid of that. You can't kill me. Tell my mom I, I don't have life insurance because I already have the best life insurance. <laughs> you know, it's crazy talk to the world. But we're here to bring comfort to one another because there is hope. And there's something way bigger than what we perceive as, as a death or loss. <laughs> there is loss. My God, it hurts. You know, to lose people, it hurts in the pain and suffering. But that's why most often we're called to the very least of these to minister this life to those that are, at least they know they're so desperate for it. You know, they know they're sick. 
that they need a physician. Like Jesus said, I didn't come to heal the well people. <laughs> I'm here for the sick and the lost and the lonely and the broken. The ones that are broken hearted. But the joy is the ex divine exchange is beauty for ashes. It's joy for your mourning. You know, we may weep for us for a night, but oh my God, truckloads of joy come in the morning. So, whew, yeah, it's deep stuff, man. Thanks, Mimi, for, for touching that place. And uh, thanks to every one of you for being here in this midst. <laughs> Who else? Ooh. <laughs> well, hey, Lynn. Uh, yeah. Hey, I was going to say, um, with everything everyone has shared, from what you shared to what Ryan shared, um, to what Mimi shared and uh, Rainy and everyone else, like Mimi was saying, you know, um, to not be afraid and to just share our hearts. And it's like, what you guys are sharing now, is opening like it was like everything was pulling on my heartstrings from what everyone has shared so i just want to say thank you to everyone for what you shared it's very meaningful and it it's really encouraging and inspiring and it, every week just coming to see all of you guys' faces and what you guys have to share it just gives me life so i'm say thank you to everyone for sharing very impactful and again just gives me so much life and hope so thank you guys Love you, Link. Love you, Link. <laughs> Good to see your face, man. Thank you for sharing. That was beautiful. Thanks, man. It was a good noodle. <laughs> wow. Come I'm on, just glad that, that we worship a, a living God. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Man. I, I, I'm glad that we worship a God who is always eternally human. <laughs> Jesus Christ is forever man. When, when Moses and Elijah appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration, it's not recorded that Jesus had to tell the guys, hey, this is old Moses and this is Eli over here. No, there was a knowing from within our family from within our humanity that recognizes the living brothers and sisters that have fallen, that have came before us and that will come. This is the humanity of Jesus in that when Jesus died <laughs> and he rose again and he ascended, he continued and will continue always to be <laughs> fully man. <laughs> oh, so if we find ourselves planted into the earth, we will find ourselves again fully alive in Christ Jesus. <laughs> there is a general assembly of, the, of all of creation in which we will all stand. And when the last judgment comes, here's the best part. We're all going to be raised human and won't look like Jesus, who's a man. <laughs> so we are the ever living ones. If someone wants to say you can't repent when you die, what, what are they saying? Why? Because you're not human anymore? You're raised alive a man, a man with a soul and a body and a spirit. And that That's is great, what John. I think this John 17 was talking about, Lynn. What you were going, what you were saying is like. When you said this exact thing, Jesus is talking in the third person. I went, shing, ding, thank you, Holy Spirit. <laughs> because he's talking about how the Holy Spirit connects the relationship between the Father and the Son that is an eternal relationship. And how the Father is only the Father because he has a Son. <laughs> and the Son is only a Son because he has a Father. And then John 17, Lynn, like you were saying, you are, we are all grafted in and included in by our, hu our ever-living humanity <laughs> yeah. to Jesus in the Son and in that union. We are woo, gobbled up into the triune dance of bliss. <laughs> Come on, dude. Amen. Yeah, he's a God of the living. 
Not of the dead. That's what he told them. He's like, before mm-hmm. Abraham was, I was. Yeah, we'll to that. Right we'll to that. Yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Yeah, that's a trip, dude. What he saw, what they saw, the Mount of Transfiguration. Like, man, it challenges me to think. I mean, is it hard for us to literally transcend form and transcend time and space? No. I mean, time serves a purpose. Gravity serves a purpose, but it doesn't bind me. (laughs) It's just there to serve me. (laughs) So we're here for that purpose and for one another. My God, come on, who are we? Surrounded by such great a cloud of witnesses cheering you on because we have what they all wanted. Now, they're like, dude, (laughs) go for it. (laughs) 